Hi everyone, I'm Perry. Hi guys, I'm Nikki. And welcome to the Divine Truth Experience channel. Today guys, we're, we have decided we're gonna talk about physical addictions, what they are, um, what happens when we, te when we go to them, what happens when we don't go to them, and basically how it essentially impacts in our own relationship with God. And then also we're gonna talk a little bit about our own experiences with various physical addictions and where, we are, where we're at with a couple of them. So, um, so yeah, that's what we're gonna be talking about today with you guys, so hopefully you guys will enjoy it and uh, it will be insightful for, for you as well if you want to self-reflect and uh, start looking at some of, your, some of your own if you haven't already. So, uh, so yeah, that's what we're gonna do. Yeah, so I think uh, for the benefit of the viewers and for anyone who's new to the channel or new to divine, uh, divine truth, divine love path, the way, however you want to call it, is I thought we'd um, outline, uh, along with Nikki, we'll explain kind of what is a physical addiction, uh, how it affects our lives, and how to tell if something is an addiction. And we'll also um, explain to you as well the difference between a physical addiction and an emotional addiction. But we'll also uh, inevitably show you that all addictions are emotional anyway. It's just that physical addictions are a lot easier to, um, to spot and gauge just because they are physical in nature. So you can see, smell, touch them and all those things. Um, so Nikki, do you want to explain yeah. what a, let's first, what a physical addiction yeah, could so be? Yeah, so a physical addiction, what I'd uh, mm. define a physical addiction is anything that I engage in in my day-to-day -day life that takes me away from feelings of hurt I have within my soul that predominantly come from my childhood or early adulthood life, essentially. So it's anything that I kind of, I kind of do to avoid my fear or to avoid you know, deeper emotions like grief. So that's what I'd say a physical addiction is. Yeah. Um, and this can range from all sorts of things. So the real common ones that anyone knows uh, of physical addictions such as smoking, that's a big, big one. Um, eating loads of food, you know, if you find yourself um, heading into the fridge quite often, <laughs> that's also quite a big um, physical addiction that a lot of people engage with on earth. Um, alcohol, uh, that's another big one that a lot of people do, especially young people like myself. I used to do that a lot my, uh, when I was younger. Um, so, um, drugs, drugs, yeah, that's another big Sex. one. Uh, social media. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a real good one. Uh, relationships. Relationships. Even things like having cups of coffee. Yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily the coffee itself. It's like the caffeine in the coffee. Um, that, that also takes you away from yeah. yourself and your own feelings. Uh, even sometimes like... Um, listening to music sometimes, or like being distracted by film, TV, numbing out, that type of stuff. They're all uh, what we class as addictions. And basically, as Nikki, what Nikki was saying was, we go to these things, and when, once we engage in these physical addictions, like we um, stop feeling the emotions that we're really feeling um, underneath everything. So there's a lot of sadness there. Um, in our emotions, and then when we're feeling sad, instead of feeling sad, we'll just go to the uh, the thing that we uh, want to get our addiction met. So, um, yeah, and one of the real uh, important things to mention with these physical addictions is that um, once you go to a physical addiction, you get like a, a temporary sense of relief almost. It's like yeah. a relief, and it's not, it's yeah. never permanent, it's just this temporary feeling of either relief or. This temporary, like fleeting moment of joy, or well, what you class as joy, we would definitely won't class it as joy. Um, but it's like just this temporary feeling that you have to keep going to all the time, um, and you're just realizing it's not filling you up on the, in your heart. And um, like one key way for, for me, anyway, that where I'm starting to realize, oh, I've just gone to an addiction, it is a feeling in me of like this urge, like I just have this real like compulsion just to go to something like I have a massive compulsion to like check my Facebook or I might have a massive compulsion to share with someone what I've, what I've just taken a photo of on Instagram or something like that. Um, and it's just like getting to a point where you start becoming more 
conscious of these like cravings that just come up like dead quickly usually um, and it's just a case of saying to yourself oh right I can feel that coming up now I'm just going to pause I'm not going to go to the addiction I'm just going to pause let myself feel what it is I'm wanting to get out of that certain addiction what it is I'm wanting to avoid as well and a key thing is just realizing that anytime you go to an addiction you're choosing not to love as well like you're choosing to um, reject love reject truth um, and that causes a, a lot of pain to yourself but also any other people that addiction may impact upon so anytime you do go to an addiction you are essentially cutting off your um, connection with like God and also you, you, you guide sometimes as well depending on what the kind of what the addiction is um, so it's a really really important subject that um, it's definitely a big thing to start focusing on if you want to remove these temporary feelings of hap happiness and if you want to then actually become more of a happy person yourself truly in your heart it's always permanent and you don't and you feel like a sense of relief that you just don't need these things anymore in your life to make yourself feel happier you just feel a lot better so that's uh yeah that's a bit of the introduction isn't it about yeah and i wanted to um just add on that like a lot of people will say it's just like how do you know it's an addiction like what what's the difference between me just doing something that i enjoy just for the love of it versus an addiction and one of the key things is like if you were to take that thing away that you call enjoy and then you get like angry about it and frustrated that you can't have it then that's a big clue that it's probably uh, an addiction it's because your addiction is not being met and therefore you start to get agitated and angry so that's one big giveaway of recognizing um, what your addiction is like taking a toy away from a kid and then you have a tantrum that's basically what happens to us as adults so if you try if you sat there and you're thinking well I don't know what I don't know what my addictions are um, start to look at when you get angry when you can't have the something that it is that you want and then that will be uh, <laughs> that will probably be your addiction and um, what we want to do today is just kind of like highlight some of the stuff that we've gone through ourselves um, some of the things that we've removed from our lives explain to you the feelings that came after that and then the joy that we've received after giving up the addiction and hopefully uh, it might inspire you guys to want to kind of break out of your prisons of addiction and start to experience some real joy in your life instead of just like these like uh, fleeting pleasures um, just kind of like what Nikki was saying a second ago um, so should we give some examples. examples? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the first one that I probably like to talk about is uh, how we're both vegans. Mm -hmm. We're both vegans. Um, I um, gave up the addiction to meat and, and dairy when probably about five months after first hearing Divine Truth. I got to a point where I was like, yeah, I, I, I started doing my own research and realizing where like how, like, why is eating meat and dairy unloving to myself, to other people, and to the environment? And through, the, you know, the process of, like, experimenting with, um, like, the feelings I was getting um, and seeing what would happen as a result. Like, one, one of my big fears with um, when I, like, made a change to becoming a vegan was I was worried about what my like what my parents would say. <laughs> that is dead worried actually. Um, particularly what my dad would think. Um, just because, like, um, my parents are of like a, of Serbian origin, and in Serbia, meat's like such a big thing. Like as in most parts of the world, but in Serbia, it's like quite a, quite a big thing where almost everyone eats meat there. And I was just there thinking, oh, I'm going to have to tell my parents that. <laughs> that um, I'm not going to be eating meat anymore and stuff and I was dead like scared and worried about what they're going to think and what then what that makes me as well. So that was like that big, big thing for me and also the fact of like I have done sports a lot throughout my life as well and I studied sports science at university and I go to the gym a lot, lift weights and just do all sorts of physical activity. And I was um, 
almost under the impression as well that eating meat is obviously great for protein, for your muscles, to build your muscles and, you know, all of that stuff. And, uh, yeah, they're not that big at the moment. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I was under that kind of impression. And the more I educated myself and um, went on the internet, looked at various YouTube documentaries, the more I started realizing how loving the whole process is. So I've been a vegan now for um, just over two years. And ever since I began, I've not once had the desire in my heart to eat meat or to have any anything dairy at all it's just not been there like i haven't been having to force myself to not do it it's just i just don't do it i don't feel the need to do it or the desire to do it and also i'm realizing just how much healthier like vegan food actually is yeah um yeah it's um i've been vegan now i started being vegan eight years ago now and for me mine was a bit more selfish originally um i just felt like i was looking a bit unwell and people were starting to say to me as well that I was looking a bit ill and so I would just kind of through self-discovery wanted to heal myself through through a natural way and it kind of lent itself um, to food so I just started to look at the food that I was eating and what happened was I actually put myself on a seven day water fast I don't really I don't know if I would really recommend uh, um, this as a loving way to go about it but I'm just explaining uh, what happened for myself so I never intended to be vegan originally. I just read this book which talked about fasting, which could clean the body out, and um, it just—I just felt like I would give it a, give it a go. So I did the seven days water fast, and then after that, I just had this feeling inside of me that I didn't want to put anything toxic in my body, and a part of that was was me, and, and it, I surprised myself, and I really didn't expect that I would want to be vegetarian. In fact, before then. I used to kind of like make fun of vegetarians and vegans and stuff like that. So I was a bit nervous that now I was becoming like this vegetarian vegan because I thought I was just like this weak person, similar to Nikki. Like I was always training and working out and stuff. And I'd only ever really seen vegans. Um, I think the stereotypical kind of like, like really skinny people. So what I did, I just started to educate myself on what to eat and um, soon came across after vegetarian veganism and just felt that, that was the way forward and I actually then went over to America and lived in a community in a, in a raw food vegan community for six months and that for me was kind of like the catalyst mm. of incorporating a vegan lifestyle and then slowly what started to happen which which for me was surprising was then suddenly I started to have compassion for the animals and the planet and the earth and the soil and everything connected to to the planet basically and that was that surprised me really because i never and i didn't used to care about animals even when i was first vegetarian it wasn't really for the animals it's like something happened and i had a change of heart and then once that happened there was just no desire like i didn't have to try to not to eat meat i just felt in my heart that that was just like unloving to do and i thought if i want to live in a living world i've got to just start being loving myself and, uh, and that's just kind of what happened. And then from then, things just progressed. And now it's just normal, everyday life. Being vegan is not a big deal. There's plenty of fruit and vegetables that I eat. And I think it's slowly becoming more popular now. I and mean, I've seen it a little bit more in, in uh, social media and stuff. Um, it's good that it's becoming more popular because it's more loving for everyone. Mm -hmm. But like at the same time, we're, we don't mind either way if, you know, People, if people are, are or yeah. not. We're not forcing people. You yeah. know, we're not going out of our way and and holding like banners above our heads, going, "Oh, we're vegan. Everyone's got to be vegan." We're, yeah. we're not doing that at all because that's just impacting other people's free will, and that's not a loving way to go about it. Yeah. It's just you, you just know what's right in your heart, and you just go by that, and you you, know, you don't need to make a fuss over it. You just do it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And one of the other things what I really started to recognize with an addiction is it's like. When you're in addiction, because it's unloving, there's always an unloving result. So when I was at this place, this rejuvenation centre, there was people that were diabetes. Um, so basically, they've been eating too much sugar. I, I, I don't know the whole science about it. But basically, then they get this diabetes disease, which potentially will kill them. So because of an addiction, it's now life-threatening for them. 
and um, not just to them, but for the whole planet as well. So what I started to realize with, with becoming vegan is, is like eating in a much more loving way actually affects the whole planet as well in a loving way. So um, yeah, I mean, just just a few yeah. like basics is that like you if you're currently a meat eater. One of the things I asked myself before I turned vegan was, would I myself kill an animal? Like, I just asked myself that moral question, would I myself be willing to kill an animal so that then I could have the meat of that animal? And as soon as I asked myself that question, I, I, I could feel the answer was no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to slaughter like a cow or a sheep or anything for, to, to get that meat or to get wherever I wanted out of them. And also, I wouldn't be able to like raise like a massive herd of sheep or something or cows in order to get milk as well, and, and just you know usually sticking them in these places where they're almost forced to produce the the milk and you know and whatnot. So I just asked myself that basic question, and then I started realizing like if I'm not willing to kill the animal myself, like mm. it's not really loving of me to then expect another person to just kill all these animals for me just so I can eat them. Like it's desensitizing the people in these slaughter of houses, you know, like they're just killing all these animals, like, like loads of them every day, day in, day out. They're just not even aware of what they're doing. And they're just like completely just not there in the heart in that, like for most of that day, they're not connected to their hearts because if you were, you wouldn't be able to just continually kill, kill animals. And, um, uh, and then also I was thinking like myself, I was going back to my own childhood and I really loved animals, as, as I'm sure all of you you guys did when you were little kids. And I was just thinking like, if I had like a rabbit or something as a pet and I was a kid, and then my dad like one day just killed it and put it in like a, a stew or something, how good I'd have been when I was a child. Because like the rabbit for me was like an awesome little like creature I used to yeah. like, play with and stuff, and I was thinking I want like children know the right thing usually yeah. when we're young. It's funny you say that because I was just thinking then to, to talk about like this. Is, someone told me like an analogy once, where if you put a, if you put a, a child in a room, let's say a rabbit or a sheep. Let's take a rabbit. So you put a rabbit in the room, and a, and a, and a punnet of strawberries. And then you and then you lay a knife just like on the floor, and then when the child gets hungry, like what do you think the child will do? You you can't imagine the child going up to the knife and then start killing the rabbit and then eating it. You I mean, you imagine the child just like playing with a rabbit, forgetting about the knife, and then just gonna go eat the strawberries. So like Nick was saying, like kids tend to know what the most loving thing is. Um, Anyway, so you can like learn a lot from from children. Yeah, and there's absolutely tons of reasons why being vegan is loving to yourself, to others in the environment. But we're not going to go into that because if you yeah. truly want to to understand it yourself, then you'll go and and check it all out off your own back. You wouldn't really kind of. Um, well, it's great if you know someone's willing to talk to you about it, but because yeah. we want to cover some other things in the video, I think like that's just a bit of a yeah. Bit, bit a, brief, a brief idea of one addiction that we don't do anymore, which if you look at the world, a lot of people do. And just that, taking away just that one addiction, you can't imagine how much that's going to save the planet. And as I said, there's tons of documentaries out there um, where you can learn the research of just how uh, much destruction is caused just from that one addiction. So, yeah. yeah. Probably the, the biggest one is just how malnutrition can just be completely wiped like off the face of the planet if people stopped eating meat, like westernised countries with this big addiction to meat, if they just stop that, there would be enough, like the food that is grown to feed these animals, to fatten them up to, for the meat, that could all be used to feed absolutely every single person on earth, essentially, like easily, like like easily there'll be enough food to go around. So just that one thing, you can see how much of a big impact it would have. Um, but yeah, like that's just that's just one, one that's small, a, that's a dead small thing as well. Like yeah. for us, like <laughs> it's just a dead small thing. It was one of the things I was like, nah, I think I feel, 
I, sh that's, I should cut that out as soon as possible, really, because it's quite obvious to me why it's so loving. So I was like, right, this is, you know, I don't need to do too much investigation on myself to realise eating meat's wrong. Essentially, like when I say wrong, I say I mean that in like an unloving sense. It's unloving. So, um, so yeah, that's mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, we're still alive and kicking. We don't eat. We don't eat meat. So you're not going to die if you don't eat meat. <laughs> um, one thing I actually was going to say with that, I've never. Uh, I was going to yeah, touch wood, <laughs> but uh, I've I've not been ill yet since I became vegan. Whereas before I was vegan, I used to get ill like every two, three months, once every two, three months. And once a month, I used to always get a sore throat. Um, that's related to all the emotions as well that I had at the time that I don't have anymore. But um, since I've been vegan, my physical body's been great, actually. Yeah. Like, it's been feeling awesome. So, <laughs> so yeah, we can say it's, yeah, it's, it is great. It's, it is. I, I would put it up there as one of the most things that I'm grateful for in all of my life that I actually do. That's how powerful becoming vegan was for me. When, when, when I'm praying sometimes and giving thanks, that's one of the major things that I give thanks for, is that I decided to become vegan. Give like, thanks to God. Yeah, uh, I can't stress it enough. So, But, you know, it's up to you, it's your life, you can do what you want. Right, next addiction. <laughs> <laughs> to do alcohol. Yeah, that's a good one, yeah, yeah, that's real. So, alcohol, man, I mean, this one was a big one for me. Both of us have had it, but especially Perry. Yeah, yeah, mainly for me because I'm a bit older than Nikki. I'm like 12 years older. So, is it 12? Nah, a bit older, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I've been pickled in all the alcohol that I had. Um, so, I mean, for me, it was a big one because I was actually a bartender. So, I worked in the bar industry for what? Started in there when I was about 16. And then I got out of the industry when I was. 29, 30, so that's what, 13 years? Yep, got my maths right. And basically throughout that whole 13 years, I was I was drinking the whole time. In fact, even before I started working in the industry, I started drinking um, as a teenager, probably around 14 years old, something like that. So, yeah, it can make me a bit sad this subject actually, just because I can see how much destruction alcohol has on the world. So just like when I said a second ago about vegan, going vegan was like one of my number one uh, grateful things that I've changed in my life. Stopping drinking alcohol is, if not close to number one with it, is, is number two. Because uh, I just can't tell you how much my life has changed by not drinking alcohol anymore um, compared to how my life was when I used to drink. So just to give you kind of an idea of how much alcohol I wasn't I wasn't what's the word an alcoholic like I didn't have to wake up in the morning and drink alcohol just to feel all right so I wasn't like an addict in that sense but I drank alcohol every night um, and when I say drinking like I was drunk like smashed like proper pissed drunk for probably about nine years like most nights I was drunk like it's quite a lot isn't it <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing now just because I feel like so different to that person who I used to be. So I used to like go to work, finish work, straight after work, we'd go out for drinks. It would just be one drink, led into two drinks, led into three drinks, led into shots, leading into like you're there three, four in the morning, still drinking. Um, I know it's quite common in the world, like people go like, what's wrong with that? Like everybody does it. Um, but then if you once you know the truth of it. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you just look at the state of like the world and what it's in, and like, if you look like at if, if you've ever been out on a night out and you're the sober one and then you're looking at a drunk bar, it looks like hell on earth. It looks just a mess. And the way you feel the next morning, you just feel a mess. And um, so for me it's just clearly a, it's a very unloving addiction towards yourself. And then potentially others depending on on what happens. Um, so I was, yeah, drunk for a lot of, lot of years. And then when I got to about 30 and I quit the bar industry, I thought to myself, look, this was around the time I did the fast and became vegan. So it was all around the same time I was starting to take more care of myself in the living way. So I cut down from getting drunk, like most nights, just like maybe once a week. And then after a while of doing that kind of, I just didn't want to get drunk anymore, but I still have a drink. And then it went from something like, all right, I'll drink, but I won't do spirits. 
and then it went from like, okay, I'll drink, but I won't drink beer. You phased, <laughs> you phased it out. I phased it out over a long period. So um, my addiction, my, my hook, my emotional hook was there all the time. And in the end, it was like, okay, I'll have a glass of wine now and again. Maybe I like you know, a celebration or a wedding, a glass of champagne. Um, to the point now where I just feel in my heart that I literally don't want to, like, alcohol for me now just feels like poison, where it never used to before. So, well, it does, like, scientifically speaking, it does poison your, your body, doesn't it? It kills your brain cells as well. Yeah. And you can tell, like, that it's unloving because you spew up. The next yeah, day. you're sick, you've got a headache the next day, you're feeling, like, literally, like, death the next day. Um, and with me, what happened with me is I started drinking when I was 17, 18, really. Um, initially, started drinking to kind of be cool and to, like, fit in with all my mates. Um, and then my drinking really picked up a lot when I went to university. So in England and, and the UK, uh, university is like a big like party in a way. Like a, a, a lot of the times I used to go out uh, with all, like tons of us at uni and uh, we used to pre-drink for like two, three hours a night before we even headed out. So by the time we were off out into like one of the clubs or bars we were already all pretty drunk um and yeah i mean for me i was like i never used to drink alcohol unless i was going on a night out so i was essentially binge drinking mm. like i used to get like on before a night out me and all my mates used to drink we used to get absolutely like smashed and uh a lot of the times we couldn't remember the night out even the next day we're like oh mate do you remember when you did that like and then you're just like oh, i can't believe i did that it's like you don't even realize some things that you do and um we'll talk a bit about why that's the case as we continue talking but um yeah for me i was drinking heavily from about 17 18 up until i was like 24 I'm 26 now, and I haven't had a drop of alcohol since I was since December 20, 2013. I just stopped on New Year's Eve 2013, and again since then I've not even had a a need or a feeling of I just want like alcohol. I just haven't had it, and for me a lot of it was about giving it up. Was like the social thing and thinking, oh, what are my mates gonna think? They're going to think I'm a loser. They're going to think I've turned into some kind of monk, or you know, they're going to think be thinking all oh, these things are going to reject me from the group. They're not going to want to talk to me. You know, the list was endless. The list was absolutely endless. And sure enough, when I said I said to my mates, I was like, "Look, guys, um, like, I think I'm I'm stopping the drinking now. It's not for me. Um, like, I'm focused on growing in love towards God and." wanted to be a, a, a more loving person to myself and also to other people. Uh, I was just like, you know, I, I just don't, don't do it anymore. And, uh, and then a lot of attack came from my friends, you know, a lot of, you know, say banter, but some, sometimes it was like quite nasty with what, what was said to me and, and, and stuff. And, um, yeah, it's just like, um, got to the point where it's just, that was enough, I was fed up with all the hangovers and, and whatnot. And like one of the things we'll talk about now is about what happens to to us, like like when you drink, like you drink. the actual truth of what happens, like spiritual, like spiritual wise. Um, so do you yeah. want to start with that? Yeah, because what I was just going to lead on to what Nikki was saying there is when you, one of the things that happened when I gave up drink was one of the first things that happened is like you meet up with some old friends, maybe you go back home, like I don't live in my hometown. And you might bump into some friends and one of the first things I say is like, can I get you a drink or do you want a drink? And then when you say, oh, I don't drink alcohol anymore, just like Nick was saying, like, oh, what's wrong with you? Come on, let's have a drink. Like, don't be like that. Like, what's wrong with you? And like, they kind of think that something's wrong with you. And what they'll try and do is try and influence you to want to have a drink with them. And if you're not, if you don't, if your will is not strong enough, you'll give in to that, like you'll give in to the peer pressure. So even though we're adults, Really, like, we still cannot be strong enough to do what we want to do with our own life. Um, so it's really important that um, to develop your will and to want to, to want to want to change and like do it for your own good. 
And when you put love as your priority, kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good driving force um, to keep you to keep you on the on the on the straight and narrow, so to speak. So, in regards to what Nick was just suggesting there about kind of what happens on a spiritual level, is that what's really, really, really dangerous and what a lot of people don't know about is what's called spirit influence. So, I often wonder actually where that where the word spirit comes from in alcohol, because <laughs> they're called spirit of spirits, you know, like your vodkas and your rums and stuff. And what Nikki and I talk about now as spirits is a person who has been on earth and then they've died and then now they're living in the spirit world. So that's a, it's a big subject that we can talk about in another video. Yeah. But for the purpose of this video, um, if you've never heard about what this spirits are, it's just a, a person who lives a life, they, they died, but what Nikki and I are saying is they haven't died, they're just now living in the spirit realm. Um, they've just got, they're just interacting now with the universe with their spirit body. Yeah. They've shed their physical body through the process of death, mm -hmm. but the soul is lives on. Like it's the, the physical body and spirit bodies are just like tools for our soul to experience life with essentially. So that's all we're talking yeah. about with the spirit. So, and what, what, what's kind of uh, key is that any addiction that you had on earth as a human in your physical body, your physical addictions, you'll carry them over with you when you're a spirit. So if I love alcohol, as me, Perry, when I die, me, Perry, will still want to get alcohol. But there's no alcohol in the spirit world. However, I've still got the addiction. I still want to get it met. Otherwise, I'm going to get angry. Remember, we talked about that before. So I, what I can do as a spirit is I can come down to the earth plane and I can influence you as the human being in the bar or wherever you are to, to have a drink. Just like I said about when I gave up drinking, I met up with some old mates and they were like, go on, have a drink, go on, go on. And if I was weak-willed, I'd join in with my mates and I'd have a drink. So the thing is with the spirits, they can do that same, they can, they can egg you on just the same. They'll push you, they'll, yeah. they'll give you emotions, won't they? Like mm. they'll, they'll they'll give you emotions like do it do it do it do it. That's just because if you like like you're saying if you're in that position where you're open and you can be influenced, that means you still have got the injury like you haven't patched it up. Otherwise, you'd never be able to be influenced ever, no matter what the, mm. someone asks of you or what what they want of you. You just won't be able to be influenced. You'd be like no, that's it, no, and that's they, they won't carry on. But if you've got the hole. And a person, and you've got a friend, well, a friend on earth who's saying, "Yeah, come on, have a drink, just one, just one." And then the spirit will also be giving you that mm. feeling as well at the same time, and the spirit is doing that so that once you start drinking, the spirit essentially, like in their spirit body, they like latch onto your physical body, and when you start drinking alcohol, they experience the same feelings that you're experiencing and that they experienced on earth when they were drinking alcohol and a lot of it is to like drown out their own sadness like the spirit's own sadness and um and that's when there's like a, a sympathetic like attraction between the person on earth who's who goes to alcohol to avoid uh pain and also the spirit who's now in the spirit world and because they can't do that now in the spirit world they, they come to earth still get that that one addiction met through people on earth mm -hmm. so it's like um like one thing i've i realized is like once i stopped drinking alcohol i went out a couple of times like with, with a few of my friends on a night out um and i just used to drink like sparkling water and 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 ice and a bit of lime and that's like our champagne now <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's like our champagne to treat ourselves to that every now and again and um like one thing i started realizing when i was there like i could see us a couple of my mates were starting getting more and more drunk as the night went on and all these other people that were also around as they got drunk more and more i could actually feel my friend like my actual friend, the personality of my friend slipping away. Mm. Like I could feel their actual personality slipping away and I could feel this completely different person was in their body and was just interacting in their body. And that's what happens, why you don't remember things when you're so drunk. Because a lot of the times, 
a it spirit. Wasn't you, just, it wasn't yeah. you. A lot of times, a spirit just came in, overcoat your body, and was experiencing things through your physical body because of your own disconnection from your own soul by drinking alcohol. It just lets the spirits all come in and they can just interact like that, in using your body. So, like, it was a definite experience to start realizing that and seeing it happen in front of your very eyes, like seeing your friends just slip away and another person comes in. And a lot, and a lot of people, when they do get, get drunk, there's like people either go one or two ways, really. They either get dead aggressive, and, you know, want to just fight all the time, or um, you know, like they, they, or they get you getting very depressed, very depressed and just dead sad. They're yeah. crying all the time. They don't know why. And I was, I was the second one. I, I uh, like the times when I got really drunk. I just used to cry all the time. Like I just used to cry. <laughs> I was just crying, and I was like, oh, I'm with all my mates, and I'm such a great time. And I just used to cry about that. Like I was never like an aggressive drunk person. I was just like. Or you just used to cry. Yeah. Yeah. I was the uh, I was the aggressive person, but towards myself. So before I had a drink, um, before I was drinking alcohol, I was I was I'd say I was quite depressed. Uh, maybe not clinical, but I had a lot of negative feelings about myself. I didn't like myself. Didn't love myself. Had no confidence. So when you drink alcohol, you get a little bit more confidence. That's one of the main reasons I think why a lot of people drink is to you know give them a boost, Dutch courage, as it's called. Um, but what used to happen to me was when I started to drink alcohol, like the, before I knew about all the, all the divine truth in the spirit world, I used to say, I was telling Nikki earlier, before I used to go out on a big night out drinking, I used to actually pray for these demons to not come and get me. That's because that's what it felt like. Because when I drank, all my demons would come and all these negative thoughts that used to, I feel like I was under attack. And I used to always, 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 without fail, when I drank on a night out, would just attack myself with all these horrible thoughts, um, suicidal thoughts. It was just horrendous. This is why I was telling you earlier that giving up alcohol was <laughs> another one of the best things I've ever done in my life. And um, so that was uh, one of the other states that I was in. So I was probably attracting spirits that wanted to attack me, and then I drank, and then it was just easy for them just to, you know, take me over, basically. Yeah, and uh, one thing I was realizing myself is why I used to drink and it was just all about it was literally like I was just avoiding my sadness that's all it was so when I started realizing I like uh, I did feel free like in myself I felt like you know I, I had to do the job that I was in to please other people uh, mainly my parents it wasn't even for me really and I was just feeling like that when I went and drunk and got like really drunk and smashed and you know when I was out partying it was just me like avoiding all of that sadness and pain that I have in my normal day-to-day -day life and it was just all that sadness and also this like feeling of just being oppressed by my own parents a lot and it was just me kind of like in a way just almost going, you know, like screw you, you know, like this is me, I'm just going to do this now. And this is why a lot of the times you get people when they work like Monday through, Monday through to Friday and then when the week, weekend comes, they're like, yes, right, now I can do what I want, now I'm going to go out, get drunk with all my mates, this, that, the other. And like, I'm not saying everyone's like that because some people do love their jobs and they don't yeah. drink and stuff, but I, I know a lot of people, particularly young people, um, the, the, a lot of young people have a similar kind of feeling as to why they do it um, and yeah it's just for me I realised I used to I used to do it just to avoid all my own sadness that I felt really in my heart yeah me too like um, I just had like a ton of grief that you know my day to day life was sad and then when I drank like Nicky said earlier I had this temporarily happiness and pleasure but it soon quickly <laughs> crashed starting the next morning you wake up feeling terrible <laughs> yeah well not even even in even in the act towards in the night when i was still drunk i was getting mm -hmm. all these demons mm -hmm. from like i said so i'd have like two hours of happiness and then the rest was just like this, this destruction which then destroyed my relationship that I was in because i'd get just totally annoying with my girlfriend uh, at the time and uh, that broke up not just because of the drinking but you know through an amalgamation of different emotions so i think we don't need to make it so obvious that like everyone knows the dangers of alcohol 
Um, but the thing is, I don't meet many people who don't drink. Like, it's a bit rare. And then you get the people who are like, but what if I just have, you know, a glass of wine after work or a beer now and again, like... Or a wine with my mirror. Or... Yeah, and it's like, there's all these excuses. And for me, it's just like, if you're going for alcohol, it's poison, it's not good for you. And so there's going to be a reason, whether it's one glass, two glasses, or a night out, whatever it is, you'll have an excuse. But for me, as far as I'm concerned, it's an addiction. So, um... Well, it is, isn't it? <laughs> we've learned that already. We've felt that from God, like, yeah. we felt that... Yeah, my alcohol is and I love yeah. it. And we, like probably us both, if we've had people going, oh, you're just boring, look here. Yeah. Like, have some fun in your life. And I'm just there now going to the person, you know what, mate? I'm actually enjoying my life a lot more. <laughs> like, you may not believe it, but I actually am. I'm enjoying myself a lot more now I don't drink. I feel more connected to myself. I have more time to do things I want to do. I don't even feel the need to go out anymore. And because mm -hmm. it's all just this big, like, feeding frenzy of like spirits and people all out on a night out, and things get dead messy. And it's, um, I'm just dead happy that I'm not in that environment anymore. Um, not just for myself, but other people as well. And mm -hmm. I know also I'm by me releasing that addiction, I'm inadvertently or indirectly potentially assisting other spirits as well that have that addiction like particularly spirits who have seen me go me and Perry go through the process of not needing that addiction anymore and the spirits that were with us who used to get their addictions met through us through the drinking some of them may have been like oh look this, this these guys look they've actually stopped now and they could actually if they wanted to with their rules observe how we did it and then they could maybe t look at taking steps to release the addiction from themselves. Mm -hmm. And you just realise, don't you, how, like, as you start feeling the addiction of it, how much of a, like, how much of a prison cell it is. Like, just this, these addictions, they, they are just like, they keep you in this prison cell, really, where you're like a slave to these addictions, you're a slave to these spirits mm -hmm. of really forcing you. And, forcing you to do things sometimes that you don't want to do but it's like you just realize just like like it's not real happiness at all it's just not mm -hmm. like straight up it's just not yeah uh, i mean for anyone who's watching who does drink like again this is not judgment but uh like as i say you can do whatever you want with your life it's fine by me but um if you if you've got this little feeling in your head that it might be a problem or just after hearing us speak you might now be thinking oh gee like i didn't think it was a problem but now maybe it is I just, like, from my experience, I can't tell you how much more joy I have in my life and, like, true joy and, and, and true pleasure that I have through not drinking. And I never in a million years would have thought that I would be able to say that. Um, but hand on heart, like, not drinking is just amazing. It's mm. absolutely it's so freeing that you start to be yourself. And, like, uh, sometimes it's a bit scary because you haven't got the Dutch courage anymore. But what happens is you build your own confidence and your self-esteem comes back and you, you don't care as much what people think about you because you're more confident with yourself. You haven't got the fake confidence of alcohol. And then before long, you're like, I'm actually my own person here. And you just have more love for yourself. And that's just undescribable that you've got to experience it for yourself. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, we've both been there. We've both, you know, we're in, we're in places where we used to get absolutely like real drunk uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the time so we've both been there like we understand we we now know why we did it and we're realizing that you know what we did and why and now how much better we're feeling as a result of releasing yeah the addiction even 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 going from having the one glass of wine every now and again even stopping that has changed my life just that thing that i thought was all right okay i'll just have a glass of wine now and again so if you're one of those people I urge you, like, try it like, as an experiment. Stop that and then see what happens to your life. It's like, And even then, yeah. like, even those people have had uh, quite a few discussions with people who go, oh, yeah, but, I, you know, I don't get drunk. I just have, like, a glass of wine like, with my meal. And, uh, and then they start saying, no, have you actually seen all these scientific studies that say drinking a glass of wine is actually good for your heart and your health and your blood pressure? And I'm just there going, no. Nah. 
like there may have been a scientific study but it's definitely not true <laughs> like, yeah. like i know that's not true um because you start realizing the more you grow in love that you don't want to like willfully put these substances into your body because it causes it it creates like a disconnection of yourself it disconnects you from yourself and from your own heart and you just don't want that you just don't want that anymore and um so yeah like you know if 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 you want to drink then you know keep drinking you know that's that's absolutely cool with us but like we're just sharing what we've experienced and the benefits of that as well yeah. and uh it, it was hard for me as well before thinking oh yeah how's my life gonna get better i'm just gonna be like a, this loser who doesn't drink and stuff and now i used to think all of that and now i can say that all of the stuff i was fe fe fearing before is just not true at all yeah one of the key things as well, like if you're a youngster watching this and then you think to yourself, is what they're saying true? Look at people who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s and then see who are the ones who have been drinking all their lives and then like just look at what their lives are like versus someone who hasn't drunk. Um, there's a lot of more factors into yeah. kind of happiness, but you can see like someone who's in their, in their late age and they've been drinking a lot, there's going to have probably a lot of health problems, a lot of uh, mental problems, not feeling very happy with themselves. So you've got to decide, it's like, what avenue do I want to take? And if you're a youngster, you know, maybe you want to use uh, Nicky and I as an example. You can just think, oh, I know. these guys are telling me, like, there's like this joy which is coming from not drinking. And I can, you know, I just love to save, like, 15 years of your life of not having to drink. Like, that would be awesome. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean... But like one thing I'll say, like drinking alcohol and stuff, it's not cool. Like, no, <laughs> it's not. Like I used to think of myself as being dead cool, going out for all my mates, getting drunk, and and it's just not cool. Like it's you're not yourself. You 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 don't get to actually know other people properly when they're drunk as well, and you're drunk and you're having all these chats. Like you just don't get to like interact with a real person and you don't give all your real self out either because there's all of this other stuff going on with these spirits and you know this disconnection in yourself and you just uh like life's definitely cooler yeah. without alcohol yeah i mean i think i think like for i don't i don't think the the um that's the word i'm looking for the the lifestyle without drinking hasn't really been represented by anyone there's not many role models who who don't drink like these days a lot of the famous or the ones we get in the media, at least, um, like alcohol is like really glamorized. It's like, okay, if you can afford, you know, like an expensive bottle of champagne, then then you know that's like a status symbol, and it just means nothing. Like, you've just pissed up the wall basically, and you, it's not. It's just it's just not true, and it's not fun, and ultimately will cause unhappiness. So if you want long lasting joy. Stop drinking. <laughs> but only if you want to. But only if you want to. Only if you want to. Yeah. Like, we, we didn't force ourselves to not drink. We got to a point where we started realising these things in our own hearts and realising that what we're doing is actually not benefiting us. It's not benefiting others. And uh, it was just causing more of our own pain. And we just got to a point when we realised that in our hearts that the, and released the addiction by feeling all the, the hurt that it was all hiding and it was covering over just like that it's not needed mm -hmm. don't need it but um like one um another big addiction i probably think was uh, a good idea to talk about is like the social media stuff nowadays okay we're we going on to the next addiction yeah i think so yeah. unless you want to uh, say a little bit more i think that's well, probably enough for alcohol yeah. i don't want to keep yeah. the video too long yeah if you have any more questions or you do want to find out a bit more about our addiction and how we got through them you can just send us an email and we can talk more about that so all right alcohol done social media was our just uh most recent addiction that we got rid of should we go with social media or yeah yeah, yeah. it's all a right. good one yeah it's a good one particularly for young people and uh -huh. and because it's such a big thing on earth nowadays yeah so we're talking like facebook twitter instagram, instagram. is that it? i'm not myspace back in the day when yeah. it first came out yeah. Um, so I've probably been with Facebook since it more or less came out. Uh, I think one of the differences again is our age difference. So when I was growing up, when I was a teenager, there was no 
back, there wasn't just no Facebook, there was no internet. <laughs> so <laughs> I used to stay in touch with people just by letters. Or, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so ancient, mate. It actually does. So I either wrote to people with, with letters, or I just never saw them again, and I just was like, all right, I won't see you again, that's it. Like, I was all right with it. Is it you said goodbye to someone, you said goodbye, and I didn't have the need to think, where are you, what are you doing, what are you doing, what did you have for your dinner, what did it look like? <laughs> None of that. <laughs> I, used to, I used to travel quite a bit, you said goodbye, and then that was it. See you later. And then randomly you might bump into them in the future, and that was cool as well. So, so I never really grew up with social media. I didn't even grow up with the internet. <laughs> However, it, it was an addiction which came to me um, in my late twenties and early thirties. So um, I gave up Facebook probably. Well, I've, I've given it up on and off a few times, and um, slowly came back onto it. So I just deactivated my account. I didn't like fully go off the whole thing. And when I went off it, I did feel much, much better for not being on social media. So what I found was like. I was just addicted to finding out what people were doing, where they were going on holidays, you know, what they do at the weekend, what new job they've got, who's getting married, who's having kids. And before long, I would just would see myself scrolling through the uh, the news feed, just like looking at all people's lives, wasting hours, <laughs> wasting my own life. And like, I remember one time I was like looking at someone's pictures of a wedding. I didn't even know who the person was. <laughs> and I'm going like, why am I looking at this person at <laughs> the wedding? I was like, right, that's enough. So, um, but just recently, I came home from work one day and I said to Nick, I was like, Nick, I've been thinking. I was like, I'm pretty certain I'm just going to get rid of my Facebook because I just find it just addictive. I feel like I'm just being narcissistic. Like, like why am I showing myself yeah. to the world in this way? And funny enough, on Facebook, uh, there was a quote which said, like, this would be like back in the day, in my day, walking down the street with your photo album. Just like showing people your pictures and going, hey, look what I did. Like people would just think you were nuts, um, but we do it online so readily. Um, yeah, and also what was dead cool as, as well. Like when you came back and mentioned that to me earlier that day, yeah, I got that feeling myself. I was like, ah, yeah, it just came to me. Yeah, that's what I was, I was thinking. Gonna get into, yeah, and so I was just like, ah, yeah, like why do I still have Facebook? <laughs> like you know, what's cracking off there? Um, because what kind of we've realized is that Jesus and Mary Magdalene, divine truth, they like are already showing the way through their actions and Jesus and Mary, neither of them have any social media. Mm -hmm. Like they're showing the way for everyone else. And like Jesus mentioned every now and again, but he, he does it through his examples and and he, and he just lets people make their own decision based on that, really. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was just thinking that much, like, about like my Facebook and Instagram, like. Uh, well, Facebook was first. Facebook was first, yeah. yeah. And um, and then obviously when I saw Perry later that night, he just drops that one to me. And I'm like, mate, I had the exact same thought and I was thinking about that earlier today. And we are both like, yeah, that's, we, we've both got to chop yeah. that now. We've both got it independently. Both our guys are absolute legends. Like <laughs> they were just like, look, guys, it's probably time now. You look at releasing this addiction as well, because yeah. this is now stopping you all the time. You you're wasting now on all of this stuff when you could be focusing on becoming a better person and receiving more love from God. You're wasting on on all those things. Yeah, it was just like it just got to a point where enough was enough. And um, so we decided to get rid of Facebook. However, what we realized was like, we chopped Facebook, which, and we didn't even think about it actually for mm -hmm. the next few days mm -hmm. and a week or so after. But then what started to creep in, this is where you gotta be careful with just stopping the addiction, the physical addiction, and not dealing with the emotion. So we haven't really talked about that yet, but um, it's a major thing to be aware of. So we gave up the physical addiction of going to Facebook which was awesome, but then what we started to realize was we're spending more time, time on Instagram. On Instagram. <laughs> then we were like, shit, like, even though we've given up, we just swapped the addiction. Substitute it completely. Yeah, and we realized that just yesterday, the day before? Yeah, yesterday. two days, yesterday, yeah. Yeah, so we're like, man, it was like, we're still going to Instagram and finding out. So I feel Instagram's a little bit more loving in the sense of like, you're just not getting bombarded with news feeds, like just random or advertisements. 
Um, like you do, you can choose to follow and unfollow that type of stuff. So I justified my addiction with Instagram with from that point of view. Um, and it's just like saying, oh, they're just photos. Yeah, yeah. and I was saying, oh, it's just photos, this type of stuff. So once we both realized, it's like, well, right, we've got to give up Instagram. No, we've got to, like, we felt like we wanted to challenge our addiction properly this time <laughs> yeah. with ditching Instagram and then see what happens. And um, it was funny because the last few days, we've just been sat in the flat like with time on our hands, not knowing what to do with it. <laughs> like honestly, yeah. every day my phone gets like quite low battery. Like by the time I go to bed, my phone's almost dead battery. <laughs> now my phone's like when I go to bed, my phone's still on eighty five percent battery <laughs> because I'm not going on it, wasting time going on Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. And it's like yeah, we're just in the like in the apartment, and we're just like almost looking at each other. Well, mate, what do we do now with my life? It's like, um, so it's still quite new for us. We're still like in the process of challenging the addiction, and like now we've taken some steps to like remove these things from our lives. Our own emotions are going to start coming up. We know they're going to start coming up um, over the next couple of days and weeks. Yeah, we're going to start feeling these yeah. these underlying hurt feelings underneath as to why we were doing all of that in the first place and then once because this is a, like social media is just one addiction if we're using the same process that we used to release the addictions of meat and alcohol but now we like modifying it to social media so it's still the same process mm -hmm. of using things to avoid your own hurt and realizing what it is that you're wanting to get met out of that addiction yeah. so there's some need some need you know some desperation in yeah. you like, um, like me, like me, like me, uh, or look at me, look at me, look what I'm doing with my life. Like this urge to show people what you're doing with your life. Or, but I even used to go down the road of like um, thinking, oh, it was, a, but it was an inspirational message, so it's fine. But even then, I'm like, really, was it, or was I just wanting someone to acknowledge me? Mm -hmm. Probably, I just wanted to be acknowledged. Um, mm -hmm. So, so we're giving up Instagram, and I haven't got Twitter. And I haven't got all these ones, so I'm so I'm good yeah. to go with that. Yeah, we're both cleaned out, aren't we now? Social media. Yeah. So um so that's that addiction. We'll that's kind of like a work in progress. Um so that's we've covered alcohol, me, social, social media, media. Uh, cigarettes is one, but I've never smoked, so I can't really talk about that from a personal yeah. Um, experience. I've never smoked. Smoked. Um, yeah. When I was drunk, drunk, when I was drunk, I used to have a couple of cigarettes again, thinking yeah. I was cool. Like, yeah. um, and also I used to, I have smoked uh, marijuana a couple of times. Not much. I was never really did that. I'd probably say my whole life I've probably smoked about ten joints in total. Like, I've not really smoked much, and I only did that on a Friday night after work. What are you pointing at me for? You know <laughs> Yeah, I only did that on a Friday night after work when I was just like, oh, like oh, the whole week's done now. I can just relax. I can do what I want to do. And it's just, it's that same kind of feeling I had with the alcohol. Um, and it so happened that when I felt the hurt of that, both of those urges were gone within me. I didn't have those urges again. Mm -hmm. I never had since. So, um, yeah, that's like drugs is said to me. Of course, it's a drug, isn't it? So. Drug, yeah. Um, I guess I've done a bunch of drugs, like, so I have to go through them. <laughs> Maybe Why not, mate? Why not? All right, so I guess like it was an alcohol, and then like I smoked a joint once and spewed up. Um, so I, I thought I don't want to smoke. Um, I just didn't like smoking anyway, so cigarettes I just never did, just for some reason, I was never ever attracted to it. Um, and then I got into like, when I was about 18, like amphetamines or speed, and I did that for like a couple of years. And um, like the feeling was good for a while, but like I said earlier, all addictions are gonna end in a mess. And what ended up with me was three days of paranoia that I was gonna get murdered by a gang of kids from this nightclub. So I'd be in the nightclub, took some amphetamines, and then was like three days awake thinking I was going to get murdered. So for anyone who was thinking about doing it, remember this story. It ain't cool, it ain't funny, and addictions are always going to end in a mess. I promise you from my own experience. Guaranteed, guaranteed. Yeah, there's nothing going to be good going to come from an addiction. So although I might have been high for a while, 
it was a massive, massive low. Um, so it's up to you if you want to go down that road or not. Um, I recommend that you don't because it's very painful and you can avoid it. Um, and then, so I did that for a bit. And then I just kind of did, because of that experience, it, drugs then really, really scared me. And so um, I wasn't that excited to do drugs again. So there was a block of maybe about six or seven years where I didn't do any drugs, just drank alcohol. Um, but then when I got to mid twenties, I did try cocaine a handful of times, ecstasy just once, um, and then like this one called ketamine, which is just horrendous. Um, I could, I don't want to go, I don't want to waste the video talking about like the effects and everything, yeah. but I can just say like it's just horrendous, and all of them basically, I just felt absolutely. Gosh, it was like my soul had just been ripped out of me. It was just, my God, you know, the, the word soul destroying, that's what just happened to me. And um, I definitely just wasn't inspired. So, by the time I got to my 30s, I just, I, I just had enough anyway, just because I realized quickly that drugs weren't for me. Um, and then eventually, along with the drugs, the alcohol went, and then just everything went. Um, I did also what was called ayahuasca, which is, um, like a healing plant medicine or a ceremonial plant medicine they call it and um, which is meant to be safe and all these things I don't know too much about it so I don't want to go too much into it um, however my experience some people say they they heal themselves but I'm very dubious about it um, is in the fact that I don't think it heals the soul and um, yeah if there's no emotional work yeah you haven't healed yeah, that's a fact. Like from our experience, yeah, if it's you just, haven't had an emotional release of some kind, yeah, it was just like I had a lot of visions, and uh, like I say, I'm not an expert on it. So, you know, a lot of people might be like listening to this now and going, "Yeah, but this, this, and this." But the thing is, if you need a substance to heal, because I need, I know for a fact now you don't need any physical substance to heal, then it's going to be an addiction. So you can you can heal yourself without any substances basically. So that's all I'll say. And if you are using a substance, yeah. you're not healed. And when you go in the screw world, there's gonna be no ayahuasca, so you might as well learn to emotionally heal yourself now instead of being dependent on a drug. And also basic medication like paracetamol, yeah, you know, all of that, like that again is like you're you are taking something to avoid an emotion. Yeah. So I used to get headaches a lot. But, um, when I was a child and growing up, I've, I've, I've always used to have them, I used to take paracetamol. And even before Divine Truth, I got to a point where I was just saying, when I was like, oh no, like, I don't think I should be taking paracetamol anymore. I'm just going to let my headache, I'm just going to stay with my headache. I'm just going to let it be there and I'm just going to deal with whatever it is. And a couple of times when I was ill, even before Divine Truth, this is crazy, but I don't know why I felt this, but. Um, like I, I don't you, you guys probably had this as well but you get some kind of weird like 24 hour illness where like your skin gets dead sensitive to touch to touch and your bones just ache you've got a headache you know you're just feeling real terrible and I remember when I was like 16 this happened to me and I remember I, I, I decided no like paracetamol or any kind of medication I, and I just decided to just lie in my bed and I remember I was lying in my bed feeling the pain that I was in. And I just started crying out of nowhere. I just started crying about all this pain that I'm in, feeling that I'm just helpless. Like, I'm just looking, I was just like looking at me like, I can't actually do anything. Like, I'm just helpless, you know, like feeling worthless in a way. And I was just crying about that. And then once I went through some of those feelings, like an hour later after going through those feelings, I got up, I was absolutely fine. It was literally like someone took that illness out of me or it just left me and I got up straight away, I, you know, made myself some food and I started doing things. And I, like, and this was before I heard Jesus mention that if you just sit with whatever like physical illness you've got and let yourself feel the pain of it and start feeling the emotions of it, that it just goes, like the actual illness just goes or the ache or whatever it is, it just goes from you and that's like a feedback mechanism from your soul like showing you like if you've got this injury like this issue it's because of this emotion like everything's related to a specific emotion somewhere down the line in your soul so um so yeah that's real really, really important cool so that's drugs covered yeah
What's next? Sex. There's tons. <laughs> There's tons, yeah. Uh, I Brief, guess like... Brief, briefly and then... Yeah. Yeah, so like briefly, like there's, there's also a sex addiction. So Nick and I believe in soulmates, and that we also believe that there's just one woman out there for us. Um, we haven't met our soulmates yet, and so or well, we might have, but we don't know. Oh, we might have, and we don't know. So this is due to what we call like um, sexual injuries, and get kind of how they play out in the world and within ourselves is like um, you know, as I was saying before, if I was feeling you know some sadness or some hurt, I might go to some alcohol. There's also um, sex addiction where if you're feeling lonely, you might just go out and you might just like trying to hook up with like the opposite sex or same sex um, or both, whatever, you know, you just kind of want to fill that need um, with some sexual gratification or watching porn or kind of like, there's, there's tons of kind of ways um, to get your sexual needs met. Um, and yeah, you know, I've been, um, what's the word, like, I've been there and done that as well with my sexual addictions and I'm still working through some of my addictions. I don't kind of just like sleep around anymore like I used to, um, especially when I was drunk and all stuff like that. Um, kind of like I'm just now waiting, like I don't really want to engage physically with any other girl until I feel I know who my soulmate is. And uh, which you can maybe imagine, it's like when someone mentions that, it's like, Wow, you're not gonna have sex until like you meet the girl who you think is your soulmate. And it's hard, both of us are struggling. Yeah. And it's kinda like like who else has done that on the planet? And then you think, oh maybe just Jesus. Um and it's kind of like it's not really a truth which is known on on the planet at the moment. That's what could be normal. Like you just don't have sex until you know who your soulmate is. Like most people will just think there's a person I'm attracted to. That's it. I'll meet with them, we'll have a relationship. And obviously in relationships, we're not saying sex is like always an addiction. Like I'm not saying like, like it's bad to have sex. But what I'm saying is like we're created to only have sex with our soulmate. Um, so if we're not having sex with our soulmates, then it's an addiction straight away. So Basically, yeah, that's kind of. But I'm not a, uh, I'm not, a cert I'm not certified in this realm at the moment, so I can't. No, <laughs> talk, I yeah. can't talk too much about it. But I know, I know what I what I do know is that um, if you if you're having sex for the wrong reasons, then you're gonna go down a slippery slope, and there's gonna be some pain at the end of it. Yeah, we're both um, looking at at the moment, looking at our like the social media stuff, but also now looking at our sexual addictions um, and. You know like identifying them and trying to work on them so that's what we're doing and just like a dead big one is just like sexually projecting yeah and like you know if you see like if we're walking around and you see like a uh, you know like a a girl that like you find girl. attractive yeah you you know you look like you just look at like this is our automatic feeling we just look at them and we're like oh i actually you know i really like this, like the look of this girl and stuff and like from God's perspective, it doesn't matter what the person looks like. It's like if you if you're doing that with a person who's not your soulmate, you're in an in injury there, mm -hmm. and the only, and there's addictive reason within both of us still as to why we still do that. Like what what like if we do that, we're identifying this, start to identify what stuff we want back from that person. Mm -hmm. If they give us the same feeling back, like without even saying anything to them, it's like all done on a like an emotional level, so. Yeah, so I guess like there's different levels of like, um, of, the, of the addiction and different variations and forms. Um, as I say, I'm not like totally savvy on the subject at the moment because I've still got my own injuries regarding this, so I don't know maybe what's worse and what's not. Um, but yeah, I've got a strong feeling now that I, I don't want to be having sex with, uh, uh, with another girl who's not my soulmate. So, and like, as Nikki was just saying, even now, even having the feeling, even having the feeling of the thought for us now is like what we call a sin. It's like, it's unloving. So we're trying to get through that process of where we don't even have the thought, like we don't have the thought of wanting to drink. We don't have a thought of wanting to eat meat. We don't have the thought of- We don't have the feelings attached. And the, and the feelings, there's no desire driving us to want to drink and eat meat, for example. We want to get to a point where there's just not even, smidgen of desire 
for us to have any sexual feelings at all with, uh, with any of the women apart from our soulmate. So that's the level and aim yeah. for us uh, yeah. at the moment. Yeah. And, and for us now, when we're realizing these things, if we're like seeing a girl in the street, we're looking at them, we're realizing just how big of an issue that is for us. Mm -hmm. And whereas a lot, like a lot of, a lot of guys probably like, yeah, they always do it. You know, people are always looking, you know, uh, uh, like women do it as well, like it's both yeah. genders, but it's just this automatic thing. And, and like now we're, we're, before we didn't really see it as much of an issue, but the more we've been working on ourselves and progressing more, we're realizing like that these issues we thought were just really small, mm -hmm. just how seriously big they are yeah, and how damaging they actually are if you're engaging them so we're at a, a point where for us like even looking at a girl now it's like quite a big thing it's like quite a big problem for us that we need to like really look at addressing as soon as possible really yeah we could go down the track of being like you know with a glass of wine oh it's only one glass of wine you know what's the problem with that that's the way we look at now of like sexual projection is just like even just doing it once like we're realizing that that's damaging so so that's our next um, addiction that we would love to crack. Yeah, yeah. So I think that covers that's about it. I reckon. Emotion, uh, physical addiction. So why would this? Why would discuss physical addictions first, even though they are the cause is emotional in the root? Is because like physical addictions are quite blatant. Like you can see them happening. Um, so you can see yourself going for the wine and the food and, and stuff like that. Like it's it's obvious. Whereas and as a, 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 an emotional addiction where like if I'm a needy person and Nikki wants to fill my uh, addiction of being a needy, he wants to do everything for me and take care of me, then, you know, we'll get on just fine. So that's like what, that's an example. Or we'll, we'll be angry with each yeah, other. Yeah, which, yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah, you're awesome. You're oh, awesome. a man and wife, say for example, the woman has a belief that, which is it's quite common, um, that they can't. Uh, what's the word? They can't support themselves. They need a man to support them um, financially. Um, you know, the guy will feel happy supplying with the money, and then the money, the, the the girl will often feel like happy receiving the money, and then they'll just get on like a house on fire until maybe one day, you know, the guy comes back and says, "Hey, why don't you go earn your own money?" <laughs> yeah, and then that'll be like, "Whoa!" There'll be fireworks then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so they're kind of like some, they're the kind of like the finer emotional addictions. But what we felt was, you, it's kind of you won't be able to even feel the emotional addictions. What's going on here. if you can't at the moment even see what physical addictions that you've got going on? Um, even though those, like I say, the physical addictions are still emotionally driven, um, but it's just that you can see them happening in your life more readily because they're just like there and tangible. So that's why I wanted to really kind of make this video today. Yeah, and you see, like one quick thing to like start really feeling the yuckiness of it all. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, someone's trying to get an addiction met with me that I've, that I've dealt with, I can feel that straight away. I can feel what they're trying to get out of me. Like, I just feel it's yucky. Like, mm -hmm. like, I just don't feel comfortable with it. And I just say to that person, look, I'm not gonna do that. Because I know that's, like it would be unloving for me to then do that for that person based on the addiction I could feel coming from them to me. And that's like, the more you progress and release your addictions, the more sensitive you become to other people's addictions around you. And you realize that if you feed that person's addiction, you're being unloving to that person. Yeah. And they'll think you're an, like being a, a, an idiot or something. That's and they'll be angry. <laughs> yeah, that's what I wanted to say about it. <laughs> yeah, that's what. Yeah. Um, then, you know, they think you're an idiot. And, you know, if they think that, then they think that. Like, at least you know in your heart that you've done the most loving thing to that person. Yeah, because the next level with emotional addiction is when you become, when you start to become really sensitive. It's like what Nikki was just saying. It's like, you then, as a loving person, don't want to feed them the addiction of, an, of the emotional addiction. So it would be like having a friend who's an alcoholic and then you as his mate coming up to him, knowing that he's an alcoholic, yet giving him a, a, a bottle of wine every day, like going to the shops, buying him a bottle of wine, and giving him the wine and going, there you go, I'm, I'm, I'm saving you. Like you, you're not, are you? You, you, you're feeding him his addiction. So it's the same. And thing if you really love them, and if you really love them, you won't go to the shop and buy the wine. You would take the wine away and you would 
encourage them and you'd want to help them stop drinking. So the next level after physical addiction is the emotional, which we'll probably do a video on yeah. another time was like, you know, how to spot and feel uh, emotional addictions, which is still for us quite hard on yeah. some levels. Yeah. And one last thing I will leave you guys with is um, just for me realizing that every time I've released an addiction, I feel a lot happier. I feel more free freedom within myself. Yeah. I feel like I'm a better person, I'm more loving, I'm getting closer to God. Like there's just a multitude of these feeling of these amazing feelings when you actually feel the, that you've released an addiction. And that's just one key thing to remember is releasing addictions makes you more gives you more freedom and all these beautiful other benefits. Um, and it's not the other way around, like with the alcohol, where someone's like, oh yeah, I'm not gonna have any more fun now, now I don't drink. Like, it's just not how that, how it is at all. Yeah. You end up having more fun, like, yeah. and long, it's like longer lasting, and it's like, it's organic, and it's, it's your soul expressing itself, and yeah, 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 yeah like I, said, I can't, I can't describe it, just to add on to what Nikki just said, like, the joy you get from giving up an addiction is just so amazing that you will not regret it. You look back on your life like I have, and I'm still relatively young, I'm 38 at the moment, and I'm just going, wow, I am so, I write in my diary most days to go, God, I am so happy I don't drink anymore. You know, each day passes and I'm still saying it because I'm so grateful that I don't do it because I can't tell you how much joy I have from not drinking, not eating meat, not smoking, not doing drugs, starting to work through the sexual addictions. Like, I can start to feel this real joy and that's what we want in our lives. So yeah. if you want that in your lives as well, just kind of like hope this maybe inspire you to for you guys to want to start to tackle um, your physical addictions. Yeah, and, and and even then, once you release an addiction, for me, when I've released addictions, I start feeling like how much sooner I should have dealt with it. Like I use my will to deal with it and release it. Mm -hmm. And I've, I, a lot of the times I do still like when I've just released an addiction, I feel the sadness of my own choices beforehand to hold on to these addictions. And I, I start feeling the pain associated with using my will to not deal with it and not address the addiction and not release it. And it's just, I feel that's part of this, the whole like healing of it all as well is like realizing how important the will is and yeah. releasing these things and feeling the sadness of realizing that you were the own source of your own pain you were yeah. causing your own pain it's not god it was you based on your will so and then what i also experienced was like the um, the feelings of forgiveness and repentance to what i've done to myself so like forgiving myself but also so it was a part of that healing process was to forgive myself and to like to repent to what i've done to myself and that's quite a painful um, experience as well as in the grief of just like the amount of years i've abused myself um through my own choice so um, but you know after, after you go through that forgiveness that is another blessing to yourself like I can't describe to you how amazing it feels to forgive yourself it is so because you like you're going around your life not even realizing that you haven't forgiven yourself and you could be beating yourself up all the time without even realizing but then once you forgive yourself and the pain just comes out it is so freeing that I just can't describe it so to try it out <laughs> well yeah guys if you want to do it yeah. we encourage you just to experiment with things um what we're going to do we're going to put a link to jesus and mary's website as usual in our comments box and um and yeah um if you want to learn more about divine truth then you can easily follow the links and and whatnot and uh, yeah i guess we'll leave it at that so we hope you've enjoyed our video and it was of benefit to you in some way and until next time, we'll, we'll catch see you, you next time. Yeah. 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 Thanks, guys. Cheers.